This year marks the 53rd anniversary of the standoff between the New Orleans police and the Black Panther Party and the Desire Housing Projects. We shared that story with you in our documentary, The Story Behind the Standoff. What we didn't share, what the city council acknowledged recently, was the day police officers met the NCC up with a barrage of bullets, there was one death. Kenneth Borden was shot and killed by police officers who accused him and three others of attempting to firebomb a local grocery store. Now, Kenneth's murder is a story that largely went untold, even by us, leaving the accusations up in the air until now. When Kenneth's family, with the help of the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project, sat before the city council some 53 years later to not only clear his name, but to keep his memory alive. You hit a one big bang. Boom! Roll my phone. It was us and them, a rat a tat tat, and shooting at us, we shooting at them. And you hear all of this pop, 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 pop. Nobody entered, nobody was there. The day New Orleans police officers met the National Committee to Combat Fascism with a barrage of bullets on Piety Street, there was one death reported. But the victim wasn't a member of the party itself, and the shooting happened in the aftermath of the chaos and desire. Near a neighborhood grocery store, some say went by Nellie's or Broussard's. Residents of the community gave their accounts then of what happened. I was down on, on Pleasure Street down here, and when, uh, when the dude and the boy got shot, he hit the street. And when I seen two more hit, hit fell down in the street. Well, the little fellows, they were walking across the street, and uh, the policeman's up in Bruce Grocery opened fire on him, and he shot four times, and three of them fell in the middle of the street, and one managed to crawl on the other side of the street. Got behind this car over here with all the holes in it, and they went to shooting at me, and I kept hollering. I said, uh, stop. I said, the man is hit. They said, they don't care. The victim was Kenneth Borden, a 21-year-old man who had a lifelong battle with sickle cell anemia. According to eyewitnesses, Borden was not only shot in the head, neck, and shoulder, but there were no attempts to tend to his injuries. And he laid out there, I don't know how long, before they had any help to come. And the police came, and they blocked that end of the street off, and they blocked this other end of the street. And nobody could move nowhere, because if the police, whenever anyone would pass, the policeman would shoot and tell them to stop. According to media reports, New Orleans police claimed Borden, along with two other men, were, quote, advancing towards Broussard's grocery with Molotov cocktails and other weapons. Witnesses also debunked that Borden fired first, as once reported in the New York Times. But Borden's murder would become a footnote in the larger story of the standoff, leaving rumor to take place of fact, and Kenneth's family with no real answers. I think the effort uh, to control the narrative was the, the largest reason that Kenneth Borden gets lost in this. Adal Lampkin is the director of the Louis A. Berry Institute for Civil Rights and Justice. There was a lot of information that was lost and hidden. So, um, what is some of that information that was lost? So, we did not know the attorney that the family hired. There were no legal documents, there were no court records. The family attempted to file a $1.5 million lawsuit against then Mayor Moon Landrew, Police Superintendent Clarence Geruso, and the two officers accused in Kenneth's murder. Not only were the officers not charged in Kenneth's shooting, Judge Herbert Christenberry dismissed the lawsuit. Yet she can't find those records or the names of the other people injured by gunfire, and she doesn't believe it's by coincidence. The remnants of policies like COINTELPRO still permeate within the community. Cases like Kenneth Borton's are currently being investigated by Lampkin and law students in partnership with the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project at Northeastern University School of Law in Boston, Massachusetts. For 10 years, we teach students how to investigate cases of racially motivated homicides under um, the Emmett Till Unresolved Civil Rights Crimes Act. One of our students, Whitley Parker, um, was able to find a member of the family after doing about six months of investigation. Honoring the life of Kenneth Borden. For the family, there was an expected hesitancy as speaking about Kenneth's murder reopened old wounds. After 50 some years, but they decided to come forward, not only to set the record straight 53 years later, but bring awareness to the family member they lost and his story that was lost along with him. When this thing took place... Kenneth's nephew, Keith Melanson, tells us the day he learned his uncle was murdered. We got a knock on the door, the door and a uh, guy came and he told my grandmother, your son has just been shot in the night ward. And 
you know, it was traumatic for her. She was just start screaming and everybody got up, grandfather got up, and it was just total chaos. My older brother came knock on my door. I was living in February. Say, he shot Kenneth. I jumped up, put my clothes on, we went to Cherry Asheville. I mean, he was chaotic at the church, church hospital. There were more cops out there. And over one of the cops said, um, let's go talk to another cop. With them two one here. I heard that. I said, I'm going to let that go to, my, to, my, to myself. And then the cop replied, Oh, he did want to see that, 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 that we shot. When I heard that, I went, oh. You got into a fight oh, with yeah. officers? Oh, yeah. The day of his brother's murder, Reginald and his older brother, Edward, were then beaten by police and taken into police custody. Did you ever get a chance to see your brother? Did you ever make it in the hospital? No. The family also says there's no way physically Kenneth would be able to throw a Molotov cocktail as he recently had major surgery. Kenneth had sickle cell and Kenneth had, had just had surgery the week before. Just had a, a big cut on his abdomen. Could you imagine a week ago you just had surgery and you're trying to lift your arm from probably 150 feet away and throw a firebomb? Did they recover any evidence of a Molotov cocktail? They claimed they did. They didn't show that evidence no, to any of you? No, He had no involvement with the Panthers no, or the no, National no. Committee? The end result is that oh. Kenneth was a young man, and at 21, you kind of still a boy, as I said earlier, that just was curious. People came from all over the city just to see the spot where it happened. Kenneth's murder was devastating for his family. Reginald says it was the beginning of the end of a tight-knit relationship. Our family just was, it was really, it was heart-wrenching. We were a close-knit family. When that happened, everybody split because something that, that, that had it happen and nothing was done. Just to be shot down like a dog in the street. Several family members left the city, only returning now to revisit the wound that never truly healed. What does justice look like for this family? So if you ask each of them, they'll tell you something a little different. But everyone agrees that they wanted an opportunity for the truth to be told. So you would say the first step of this journey is awareness, and that's where we are now. Absolutely. Ken and sister Ruth also spoke with us and wanted to share her account of what happened to her brother. Hear why she thinks Kenneth was in the Ninth Ward that day in the first place and why she wants to clear his name some 53 years later.